Okay. So, uh, yep, I think we're recording now. Um, yep. I'll go ahead and kind of read the little summary. Um, so today there's going to be a roundtable discussion with journalism ethics scholar Bob Steele and former SPJ presidents Erwin Gratz and Fred Brown. Um, today we're going to explore issues in, including CNN's firing of Chris Cuomo, uh, the matter of false equivalency in reporting on matters like climate change, how to handle misinformation or outright falsehoods, and how best do we cut through the fog of political rhetoric to help our audience. Um, so that was kind of a little summary of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I guess we can start going in a circle. Maybe um, our three speakers can introduce themselves um, and maybe your relation to SBJ. All right. Fred, go ahead. You start. Start with Erwin. Oh, start with me. Okay. Well, um, I'm Erwin Gratz. I've been a radio reporter and anchor for now about 40 years, mostly with Maine Public. Um, I've been, uh, I'm also a past member of uh, the Society's Ethics, National Ethics Committee, and I'm currently uh, president of the Society of Professional Journalists Foundation, which raises money to help educate journalists and the public about the business of journalism and, and its ethics as well. Fred. Okay, I'm Fred Brown. I am a former president of SPJ uh, from uh, 97 to 98. I uh, spent 40 years, well, 50, including the time I wrote a column after I retired, uh, as a political reporter, mostly at the Denver Post. I taught media ethics at the University of Denver and just recently retired. Uh, from that, I still do some consulting. And uh, last year, I finished the fifth edition of SPJ's uh, media ethics textbook. And I'm Bob Steele. I, uh, I grew up in uh, Indiana, went to DePaul University, the foundation of uh, Society of Professional Journalists. I uh, first became a member of uh, SPJ in 1968 when I was an undergraduate at DePaul. Uh, through the years, I worked in Maine as a television reporter at WLBZ TV and continued on in uh, broadcast journalism for a while and then earned my doctorate in journalism ethics from the University of Iowa. Uh, I was at the Pointer Institute in St. Petersburg, Florida for about 20 years, working with journalists across the country and around the world on issues of ethics and professional standards. I've had a chance to uh, do uh, consulting for uh, NPR and currently for WBUR in Boston on ethics standards. And uh, I've been very fortunate to uh, be involved in the world of journalism and journalism ethics for a good while. Right. Well, let me uh, point out to our audience that uh, we, we can and will make time for your questions. Go ahead and put them into the chat and uh, we'll do that. So, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Um, I want to begin uh, by acknowledging how much has changed in our time in the field. Uh, new staffs are smaller. Country is more politically polarized. And the issues our society is dealing with seem more consequential, whether it's the latest chapter in our struggle over race, or more recently questions raised about the very future of the democratic process in the United States. My first question is, is it getting more difficult to be an ethical journalist? Bob? I don't think it's necessarily more difficult than it was in decades past. For instance, in the 1950s and 60s and then into the 70s, uh, the civil rights movement was very challenging to cover from a journalistic and ethical standpoint. Uh, coverage of uh, Vietnam was very challenging. And we could go through the decades and find uh, many issues that were uh, uh, ones of complexity and contention. That said, I think that the current situation with the great political divide in this country makes it very hard. And I do believe that the transformation from print and broadcast and cable in their traditional senses to digital platform and digital journalism has created many new issues, which make it increasingly challenging. Whether it's more difficult or not, I'm not sure, but it is very hard in this era. Fred. Uh, you know, uh, Bob, you mentioned the, the internet, which of course I think is the, the biggest challenge to ethical journalism that we've seen, uh, at, even as other technologies emerged over the, the last century or so, uh, 
and, and a part of the reason for that is that it, it is it's more in some ways it's more intimate and in some ways it's more distant and i think in its intimacy it has encouraged more of a a desire among both sides of the conversation to be less objective and more uh, analytical, perhaps, or in the worst sense, more opinionated. And it only contributes, I think, to a division, which does make it more difficult to be ethical, to be not necessarily objective, because I don't really know that that is achievable, but uh, more difficult to be impartial. But do, do we have to change how we do this because of the extreme polarization, from, because of the challenges that we're facing right now? I think there's there's pressure, and I have seen it in my role as a as an instructor at the University of Denver that uh, students are amazed even that um, there are codes of ethics employers have written that say you can't wear political buttons or you can't put signs in your in your yard or stickers on your bumper of course part of that problem has been solved by the disappearance of bumpers but uh they 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 want to be able to express where they stand uh, and they want to be able to contribute to what they think are important changes in society, not just stand back as an observer and uh, report in a stenographic fashion on what's going on. I no, think Bob. that's really true, Fred. Uh, at the same time, uh, I have always offered my thought on this to journalism students and journalists that the most important way in which a journalist can contribute to society and to democracy is through excellent ethical journalism rather than activism. Uh, there are very few people in this country that have the kind of unique roles that journalists have. Judges have that role, I believe, in, the, in what they play in, in the judicial system. Uh, but journalists have that, that very special duty to cover the complexity and contention of our society, the issue and events in ways that inform the rest of the public. And if we as journalists step away from that and become participants in the fray to bring a level of activism to the uh, issues, even if we believe very passionately about those, then I think that undermines our ability to be independent journalists who serve that unique role. Well, you know, that, that actually brings us to a subject that um, I was gonna to touch on later as, as well, which is that um, National Public Radio has just revised some of its standards for exactly that, when its people can participate in protests or other social activity. Um, you know, it, it, is that, a symptom of the times we're in? And do you think that will prove useful? Well, I think it is a symptom of the times. Fred appropriately described what many journalists, particularly younger journalists, but some veterans as well, feel about becoming involved out of a sense of uh, obligation to the issues. And uh, the new NPR standards, I'm going to read from it right here. NPR editorial staff may express support for democratic civic values that are core to NPR's work, such as, but not limited to the freedom and dignity of human beings, the rights of a free and independent press, the right to thrive in society without facing discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity, disability, and religion. And in creating that new standard, uh, which I, I think is very thoughtful and meaningful. Uh, I, I think it opens the door to an erosion of the principle of independence. And I still believe that that is one of the linchpins of the journalistic duty in our society. 
to have a primary obligation to the public in the pursuit of the truth and the reporting it as fully as possible. And if we, as I said before, are part of the issue ourselves, if we get involved in it through our own active participation or strong activism, I, I think that can undermine the, uh, the independence. You know, I, I spent about half my career as an opinion writer. I wrote editorials for the Denver Post and I wrote a column after I retired. Uh, but still, I felt an obligation to be fair. And it is a little bit confusing, especially to the public, that uh, uh, print publications in particular, and now more and more broadcast stations, have editorial philosophies um, that in print are separated physically in, in the publication, but aren't the lines aren't so clearly drawn in bro broadcast. And I think it's, it's confusing to the audience, it's confusing to the public, and increasingly, I think it's confusing to some of the journalists who are, who are practicing reporting and sort of very often, I should say, tempted to uh, insert a little bit of what they think about what they're covering. Fred, did you ever have a, a moment where there was an issue that you felt so personally patient about that you even considered for, for a moment of going beyond what you could report and then write when you're on the opinion side and become a personal <laughs> activist? Did that ever get, get to that spot for you? Yeah. Uh, in fact, there were some things that, that I, I spent most of my career covering politics in one way or another, either as a reporter, as a political editor, or as an editorial writer and a columnist. Um, and there were times when, you know, particularly when I was a reporter and writing a more of a kind of a political gossip column, that I was tempted to say, well, this is wrong. Or sometimes good people do bad things, but I, but I had to I had to stifle that, and I, because I felt it was important not to show that part of my of my belief system uh, in uh, and tempt people to criticize me for for being too liberal or, or or too conservative. In fact, even though for most of my career I I actually was registered as a Democrat because I wanted to vote in Democratic primaries. Mm -hmm. And I once confessed that in a column and um, I was surprised that I didn't get more reaction. Mm -hmm. I, I used to quite often speak to uh, public service groups and uh, uh, rotary clubs, that sort of thing. And I remember I was speaking to a Republican men's breakfast once and somebody stood up and said, I know everything about you. You are registered as a Republican and you drive a Mercedes. And I said, actually, I'm registered as a Democrat and I drive a Jeep. <laughs> so, so apparently I must I, I, I must have pulled it off, pulled off a, a enough of a cover up that people really couldn't identify what my politics were. Yeah. Erwin, how about you? Have you ever read an issue that you felt passionately about that you considered stepping outside of journalism to be involved? I haven't really um, in the years. I certainly, I certainly have, frankly, lots of opinions about uh, the way I think things should go, but I generally just keep them to myself. I don't think it's useful um, as a journalist. Um, and I, you know, I also think, and, I, and I'm sometimes way too practical about this stuff. I mean, we're a country of 330 million people. There are more than enough people out there who probably agree with the things that I uh, agree with who can go and fight that fight. It's just not my role in this, in this society. Um, so uh, no, I've never really been, been pushed, although, um, and we, we may wanna kind of talk a little bit about this. I am kind of curious about the, the situation we're finding ourselves in increasingly where attacks are being made on the way we elect office holders. Um, Jay Rosen, who teaches at, at NYU, writes a blog called Press Think, has said ever since Donald Trump started running in 2015 that he's waging some kind of asymmetric war uh, 
on the media. And Jay says, if we continue to just do our jobs as political neutrals and fact finders, um, we're actually helping him. And I'm not, I, you know, I don't really know what else we can do, frankly. Um, you know, if the country really wants to go down a road towards a more authoritarian government, is it really our role as journalists to say no? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to grab my online or hard copy dictionary and look up asymmetric again here to uh, <laughs> make sure I understand what you mean. But uh, I, I do believe it's our role to challenge the actions and the beliefs of the powerful in that sense of holding them accountable. And I think that it's, it was very appropriate during the uh, Trump administration as it was previously with the Biden and the Bush administration, I'm sorry, with the Obama and the Bush administrations and now with the Biden administration to hold those leaders to a very high level of scrutiny. And that includes reporting when they aren't telling the truth. And there was significant evidence that former President Trump was not telling the truth on many occasions. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. he was bending it, sometimes he was stretching it, and oftentimes, quite frankly, based on the evidence, he was lying. And I think that uh, the journalists should be straightforward and report that, not out of a personal opinion, but out of the responsibility to be factually truthfully reporting in a fair way. You know, <clears throat> Bob knows this too, but one of our local anchors on uh, the NBC station in Denver uh, made quite a bit of a splash when he criticized our one of our members of Congress, Lauren Boebert, who represents the, a more rural area of the state, for doing outlandish things. Uh, and saying that, you know, what, what are we as reporters supposed to do about that? Can, just just throw it out there as straight news or, or, or give it a little context. And he said that he didn't really have an answer, but his raising of the question got him a lot of attention. Yeah. And I and think you know, it's great of, that he raised it. Yeah. yeah. yeah I was, I was going to say, it's what, you know, one of the things that I kind of wonder about in this, this, <clears throat> you know, clearly former President Trump really went after the press in some ways, doing things like, for instance, penning them in at campaign rallies and then pointing towards them and inciting the crowd against them. You know, and at some point, and this is what this is what Jay is trying to get at, I think, the question is, you know, do we just stand there, take it, and kind of keep marching along, doing what we've always done, or is there a point in time where we need to behave somehow differently in order to defend our prerogatives as truth tellers um, and, and, and counter what, and, and, and try to increase if, uh, our credibility with the, the American people? I don't think we should behave differently. I think we should behave professionally, thoughtfully, skillfully, intelligently, and with a real passion for what journalism can and should do. We will not convince Donald Trump nor many of his supporters that journalism plays a significant role in our society. They will believe Donald Trump's enemy of the people expression. And I think that there is a role for editorial writers and for columnists uh, to challenge that in a very specific, straightforward, pointed, opinion-based way. But for those journalists who are covering the news, do it well, do it with excellence, and do it ethically. Yeah, I, I think we make a mistake if we lose our temper. Um, and we should lead by example rather than necessarily fighting fire with fire because a lot of the of our critics are really a, a bit unhinged and we should be careful as journalists to make sure we're, we stay on our hinges and the reality is uh, over these recent years we've had an increasing number of political leaders including governors 
in the state of Maine and other states, yeah. a former governor LePage in this particular yeah. case, and others, while they haven't been as outspoken in many ways as President Trump, they certainly were outspoken and critical. And it would have been easy to, as you put it, Fred, lose our temper and lose our bearings and uh, go off the rails and diminish the role of the journals. Yeah, I mean, I mean what, what in some cases is happening, what people like LePage are doing is they are, they're breaking through old norms. And, and I guess what I hear both of you saying, and I, I'm inclined to agree with you, is that if they want to try that, they should or, or can, um, but we should continue to uh, do what we've done, do the job the best way we can, aim for the truth, aim to be fair and balanced and all of those things that give our reports more credibility. And I think there is one thing we can do in addition to uh, doing that excellent work in the way you just described it or one. And that's, I think it's appropriate for news leaders in the organizations, the editors, the news directors, the executive producers to write and express uh, in print, uh, online, on the air, why and how we make the decisions we do journalistically and ethically to explain the process that leads to a product. And I think the better we explain it, the more likely at least much of the public will be to further understand what journalism does and what its role is in society. Some will still dramatically disagree with what journalists do. Others might say, ah, now I see why they used anonymous sources or why they covered this story in this particular way and tried to balance the multiple different positions on this contentious issue. But we should explain ourselves more often and, and better. Yeah. I think transparency is perhaps one of the most important ethical principles that maybe hasn't received as much attention in the past as it deserves. Uh, I, we as journalists, and I think, you know, I've been retired for a long time, but I, I still think of myself as a journalist. It's sort of like, you know, entering the priesthood. Uh, but we as journalists have an obligation, I think, to be as transparent as we can be and as we expect our sources to be. It's another way that we can lead by example. I agree with Father Brown on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about um, the one of the things that has changed in the time that the three of us have done journalism is, of course, uh, the internet has given rise to voluminous additional information and sometimes misinformation. And I wonder sometimes on a practical level, how do you handle some of what is said on the internet that perhaps is patently untrue? Do you attempt to correct everything that may be out there? Or are there times when you just don't try not to give it additional air, if you will, by repeating what's out there. Go ahead, Fred, take a swing at it. No, no, I was going to say the same thing. The same thing applies to outlandish statements by by people in leadership positions. Uh, do you say, well, this is, here's what this person said, and it's absolutely ridiculous, or do you just ignore it? I think there is a danger in ignoring it. Uh, and there's also a danger in repeating it in that people might say, well, I agree with that part of it, but I don't agree with what you said about why it's false. Uh, it, it is a real conundrum. There are, uh, I, I compare it to uh, people, well, people now, if they are looking for affirmation, have no shortage of places to find it on the internet, on especially publications, wherever. If they are looking for information, they'll go to a variety of sources, but increasingly there are fewer, the, increasingly there are fewer, that's kind of an oxymoron, <laughs> but uh, there are fewer people who are willing to seek out information and not just an affirmation. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, my sense is that we should keep the bright light of scrutiny blazing 
rather than operate in darkness. So I, I favor reporting on with context, with probing, with fairness, those matters in which misinformation and disinformation and outright falsehoods are expressed. And, and there's, a, there's a correlation uh, element to this, and that is the decreased editing role that that news organizations play, that uh, speed has always been the enemy of journalism when we fall prey to going too quickly without thinking it through. And now newspapers and many broadcast and cable organizations have fewer editing, indiv fewer individuals who are doing the editing and the editing process doesn't have that level of quality control and check and balance to it that it had before. And then there, so there may be a hesitancy on the part of some journalists to do that kind of challenging and misinformation or disinformation or falsehoods because they don't have an editor to backstop them along the way. And also there may be journalists who just fly too quickly and use Twitter and other forms of social media to go after something without thinking it through and then having some sort of stopgap with an editor that says, wait a minute, whoa, how do you know that? Which is the best question in journalism, I think. And <laughs> where are you going with this? So I think all those are factors that are part of the response to your question, Erwin. Let's talk about uh, names for a bit. There's been a movement in the United States in the past few decades to kind of increase the focus on personal privacy, led Congress to make driver's license and registration information off limits to the general public. Uh, they've done something similar to protect medical records. Uh, groups supporting domestic violence victims want the names of those victims often withheld. What does it mean for journalists that it's getting harder and harder to find out the names of people who are in the news? And is that something we need to be concerned about? Well, the best stories are as complete as possible, including names. When you take a name out of a story, it uh, leaves a, a bit of a hole right there. And it can also raise questions on the part of the reader, viewer, listener as to whether it is true that that person really exists for instance, or just a question of who that person is. Is it this person or is it that person? So uh, I think there are difficulties there and I'm a big believer in authenticity of getting the names and the stories. And yet I also accept that there are a lot of legitimate reasons to withhold names when you have very vulnerable individuals. I think the key is to determine how vulnerable that is, how, how vulnerable the individual is and how imminent the danger is to that individual. You weigh it on a couple different scales at the same time. Yeah, I, I think there are two types of problems here. One is the relationship between reporter and source, where the reporter is asked not to use the source's name. Uh, and I think that is a, that that's a situation where in a lot of what happens in government, uh, especially in Washington, D.C., people expect that there be a, a certain, almost an assumption of anonymity. Uh, but outside of Washington and New York, perhaps, and, and business circles, uh, there is and should be an expectation that if someone is going to tell you something, you ought to be able to say who that person is so that there is uh, more of an opportunity for the person reading that story or listening to that story to decide whether there is some hidden agenda on the part of the person who gave you the information. The other kind of information that's withheld is when it's withheld by, say, law enforcement or some other government agency, which is a challenge to a good reporter to find out that information to determine whether there's a good reason for not naming that person. And if there's not a good reason, 
uh, at least saying in the in the interest of transparency, at least saying that there was an attempt made to find out, and maybe even say that uh, it, we you know uh, felt it would have been important information for this story, but we were unable to get it from the authorities. Yeah, which I think, I think comes are, back comes back to Bob's point that that um, you know we should perhaps explain ourselves a little more frequently than we yes. Can. Yeah, and I think that explanation is certainly a matter of transparency, and it's also a matter of accountability. To just say we did it this way without having the accountability for why we did it for really good reasons is a hollow transparency. I, I remember many years ago when I was teaching at the University of Maine, I was having these very similar discussions with the students then, and I've had them with journalists across the country ever since about too easily giving protection of anonymity to a source. And I've always believed that it's not wise for one individual journalist to grant that anonymity on her or his self, own self. It should be run by at least one top editor who would then also know the name of that source before the decision is made on giving anonymity or confidentiality is what it really is because the, the source is not anonymous. It's just the source being given confidentiality. So I, I think that's an important step, which too many news organizations don't follow. Uh, and individual journalists are either pressured by or too easily on their own just give that uh, confidentiality to a source who says, I'm going to tell you something, but only if it's off the record, only if you don't use my name. And then we start eroding the quality of the journalism. Uh, as Bob, I think it was. Oh, go ahead, Fred. No, I was going to say, I, I think it was in one of your <clears throat> lectures at the well, at Pointer, which <clears throat> really gave me, really increased my interest in ethics when you were you were in charge of that part of the of the program at Pointer, uh, that uh, there was a, an example that has stuck with me through the years of a candidate for lieutenant governor in Minnesota, who uh, whose campaign managers asked, told a reporter they had some information on the other candidate for lieutenant governor, but he wouldn't give it to him unless he could promise anonymity. So, so um, the reporter said, well, I'll have to ask my editor. And he told him what the, what the situation was, that this, this person had been questioned about shoplifting at some point when he was still a very young, young man. And he went to his editor, who I believe was David Hall. St. Paul Pioneer Press, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, said, uh, I've, I've got this story, but the source said, uh, we can't use it unless we promise confidentiality. And the editor said, that's a ridiculous charge. Let's go with that instead of like, naming, uh, you know, getting into this whole shoplifting thing. Uh, and it, it ended up going to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can you can take it from there because you know it. You know the situation. Well, I, I'm trying to remember all of the details, but you you're very close on those, those facts from long ago, Fred. That's good. I think there were several journalists involved, if I remember correctly, uh, when this uh, uh, lieutenant governor candidate said that, or the opponent lieutenant governor candidate, and just said, I'm going to, we use the term, drop a dime on this supposed yeah. candidate here. And, uh, but you, you, you can't use my name on it, and however it was expressed. And none of the journalists pushed back on it at that moment. That was when the journalist should have said, you know, we can't make you that promise uh, at this particular point. We don't know what it is you're going to say, why you're going to say it, what the justification is for saying it. We can't make that promise to you. And by agreeing, in essence, if you will, to not oppose it, they left themselves wide open. And you're quite correct. It went through the court system, the appellate court system, the Supreme Court, and uh, 
the journalist lost in that particular case on a breach of contract, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Or yes. what is that about right? Yep, I think. That, that's yeah, that. right. I remember that case. Yeah. Um, and uh, yes, that's exactly what it was. The Supreme Court said, yep, you guys agree. That's a verbal contract, perfectly enforceable. And, and as a result, um, I believe, you know, the news organizations involved, I, I guess it was a civil suit. So they probably ended up having to pay the guy a fair amount yeah. of money. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, as but journalists, was, yeah, the real story there, I think, as a political reporter, was what a dirty trick this was. <laughs> not, not that there was anything that the candidate should be ashamed of, although you know maybe a little bit ashamed. But uh, it, it was it was a perfect example of how uh, politics can get out of hand. Yeah, and I think David Hall, the, the then editor of uh, Finder Press, was standing on a correct principle journalistically. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they had they were trapped in some ways. Uh, the trap door had opened, the journalists had stepped into that trap door and uh, having no idea would go through the legal process. Ethically, I think they did the right thing. Legally, they uh, unfortunately set a very bad precedent that still applies in, uh, in journalism to this day. You know, as journalists, uh, we are taught to seek out varied viewpoints. Our SPJ code talks about providing context, seeking subjects of news coverage to allow them to respond, supporting the open and civil exchange of views, even views journalists find repugnant. But all of these practices, I think, assume a genuine dispute about facts or their implications. So what about the case when there is really little debate, at least among experts in a certain area? Something we might say at this point about climate change, something that we might say at this point about uh, the efficacy of vaccinations for COVID-19. Um, how do we present the doubters without distorting the reality? Yeah, and that has been a, a big discussion in newsrooms uh, forever, and particularly in recent times with this notion of false equivalency, of giving equal weight to a very small percentage of people on one side of the issue when the other side of the issue has the preponderance of scientific evidence, for instance. And, and I don't mean to suggest a lot of issues only have two sides. Most issues I think of contention have multiple sides, but, but uh, I think that the key here is for the journalists to not ignore that there are other expressions other research, other opinions out there, but to be very diligent and very uh, skillful in going after what is legitimate opposition to the significant majority of opinion and then decide if it deserves some element of coverage. But to bring in the notion that we need to balance it 50-50 is a very false concept, and that is that false equivalency notion. Yeah, um, you know, another example is uh, election deniers. Uh, they get probably much more coverage than they deserve. I mean, nothing has emerged to disprove that the election was fair and that Joe Biden won, uh, simply because more people I was going to say not necessarily more people liked Joe Biden, but more people disliked Donald Trump. Uh, but, you know, and what Bob has said is correct, that we, we, we can't totally ignore the deniers, uh, especially in that particular area where they seem to have so much more influence than they do in other areas. But, you know, I was raised by a scientist and the, one of the premises of science is that, you know, you are always working to disprove what you can and to come up with a better theory or a better explanation for what's happening. Uh, so I have a more probably more of a, a, an understanding of those who are challenging everything than, uh, than perhaps uh, others who believe that, every, that things are settled. You know, I do believe, however, that 
two plus two equals four invariably. Uh, and if you can find a way to prove that it equals five, I might listen to you, but I'm going to be very skeptical about it. No, there's something a little bit related to this that I was thinking about. It's an issue that um, uh, Baltimore Sun a reporter um, uh, gave rise to a couple of years ago. He was talking about covering Baltimore's protests following the death of Freddie Gray. And, and there were a series of protests, some of which were, were quite nasty, involved uh, buildings set on fire and, and some violent activity. And he, he told us that um, one day, he, you know, in the midst of this, he got a call from his office, told that there was going to be another protest downtown, and it looks like it was going to blow up, and he should go and cover it. And he did. Um, but he said as he drove to the area of the protest where, where things did happen, um, he said he went through about half the city and saw um, kids playing basketball, people on the streets going shopping. And he realized as he was driving down that the image that was being created by intense coverage of the protests, namely that Baltimore was somehow, you know, burning and, and enthralled to this, was just not true. And I think that also raises the interesting question of context. Um, and sometimes we perhaps in, in going after the more dramatic, um, we have to be aware that, you know, it's not, whatever's going on is not happening everywhere. Amen. That's an excellent example. And mm -hmm. it, it tells us that uh, there is another story. There, there are multiple other stories to be told. And sometimes they can be woven in to the main story. As I was driving to the protest downtown, I saw teenagers playing basketball. I saw people coming in and out of grocery stores. It wasn't until I got into such and such block that I saw it. Or it can be the lead story, it can be a sidebar. Uh, we shouldn't ignore those pieces of the story and your use of the word context is one that we should boldface and put in uh, 36 point type. Yeah, yeah that, that is an excellent example. And I, I, I think we're attracted too much to shiny objects and not nearly, well, the everyday is the everyday. So we don't, don't really cover that. I mean, you know, the old story about, well, it's news when an airplane crashes, but how many, how many safe landings are there in a day? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the failings of journalism and, and something I think we need to be aware of that we can't always necessarily cover, but we ought to on occasion try a little harder to establish context. And we can contribute the add uh, contribution of the problem with a diminishing role and fewer assigning editors uh, in newspapers, <laughs> yes. certainly, and to yes. some degree, again, in broadcast. And, and, and it's one of the, of the weaknesses of the digital platform that there are many individuals who are well-intentioned, uh, some of whom may have reasonable skills, but they're operating on their own. They don't have a colleague slash editor to again ask that question of how do you know that and what else did you see and what are the larger pieces of the puzzle of this story? So the individual journalist or quasi journalist in some cases or just individual who's spewing information doesn't have that check and balance. Well, throughout the years, there are individual failures of ethics, perhaps most recently, um, CNN first suspended anchor Chris Cuomo for helping his brother handle charges of sexual misconduct by Andrew Cuomo. And Chris has now been fired. Um, as far as journalism ethics goes, uh, this wound up being an easy call, but uh, Cuomo did own up to some of this many weeks ago. Did CNN wait too long to act? It would have been, Actually, I think the onus is perhaps on, on, on Chris Cuomo, who uh, probably should have thought more in depth about this at the beginning and said, you know, while this is going on, I am just either going to take a leave of absence or, or just not to cover my brother at all. Uh, probably the, in his case, where his brother's the governor and he's an anchor, he should have taken uh, just gone dark for a while. 
Indeed, he should have. And I think a lot of the onus, as you put it, Fred, is on him. That said, uh, I have no doubt that some of the top executives at CNN on the news side and up through the corporate structure knew of what was going on, at least in part. And for whatever reasons, including ratings, which was most likely a factor because he was, if not the top rated uh, uh, host on CNN, uh, very close to, and I think he was probably the, the number one rated, that may have entered into it. If it didn't enter into it, loyalty to him entered into it. And if those two factors didn't enter into it, a slowness to act for whatever reason, because they didn't want to create controversy may have entered into it. I think probably all those factors were, were at play in this situation. Chris Como should have responded personally himself, made better decisions early on, going dark, as you put it, Fred, stepping aside. The uh, executives at news and at the corporate level of CNN, for all those reasons I stated, should have responded differently and more quickly. It's a stain on CNN and it's a stain on journalism. Sadly, I'm not sure how much the public cares about it, uh, but they should. They should. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, we've, we've had uh, individual foibles by reporters and, and prominent news organizations before. These are things news organizations can recover from, although it may take a while. I see we have a question from Bonnie. Okay, I, you are correct, we do. So here's the question. How would you handle this? A candidate for governor refused to release his tax returns. When a reporter had a one-on-one -on -one interview with him, he broke into tears uh, he, and said his mentally ill sister was listed as a dependent and she might kill herself if that became public. Clearly, the candidate's crying was newsworthy as well as the reason why he was withholding his tax return, but ethically, what do you do in a situation like that? Hmm. <laughs> I'm and still rereading re re I'm re 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 your question right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, this is one of those, uh, with, with due respect to Bonnie posing, and I think it's an excellent case, her question at the end, what is the ethical answer, is a trap door when it comes to ethics. We should not start with saying, what is the answer? But we should start by asking some questions. What do I know? What do I need to know? is the dual first question we need to ask. In this particular case, why is the candidate for governor concerned about the connection between his tax return and his mentally ill sister? There may be something specific in that tax return that relates to it, but I'm not sure what it is. And I guess it's because she's a dependent, but what is the, the concern? I'd wanna, I'd wanna you know, respectfully and empathetically ask this individual, what kind of help is uh, his sister has received in terms of her mental health challenges? What kind of protections are in place in this particular situation? I would be searching for uh, alternatives in this particular case of what could we do to keep moving towards reporting the story while showing great respect for the candidate and for his family while not just canceling out the story. I think there's probably a reasonable alternative here uh, that can be arrived at in which the reporting on his tax returns becomes a legitimate fair story that still protects this sister and her uh, personal mental health issues. Uh, if he's a candidate for governor, uh, I, I think, or a candidate for any high office, I think to not re release your tax returns to me is unconscionable. Yeah, it would seem to me that that certainly uh, who his dependents are um, does is not a, as important as what his income is or where he is, uh, how he is making the money that he's reporting. Um, if you release your tax returns and re redact the name of one of your dependents, uh, certainly reporters are gonna say, why is this redacted? And there are some reporters who might say, well, I don't care about that. I'm gonna say that 
you you can you can can't explain why you did it to my satisfaction. Um, but I would say if you are the person who has so solely found out about the, these tax returns and you know why he is reluct has been reluctant to release them you can just negotiate ask the right questions as as bob has said about is there a way we can release the pertinent information without naming or without having any indication that there is a mental health problem in your family in, in this case, as in virtually any ethical issue that we're dealing with, oh. the guiding principles come into play. Uh, I, I worked with a number of excellent journalists over the years, including a handful, probably a dozen or so back in the late 80s, early 90s, who helped craft the guiding principles uh, for journalism. Uh, not that there weren't some before, but we articulated those very specifically as part of the first edition of the SPJ handbook that Fred is, is dutifully uh, continuing to expand wonderfully into uh, further editions over time. But we used three principles at that time. Seek the truth and report it as fully as possible. Act independently and minimize harm and be accountable was the fourth one added by SPJ in a revision of the SPJ Code of Ethics. Uh, um, blank, blank, 96. 96, thank you. So the key with principles is that they are always in tension with each other and competing with each other. In this case, you have three principles, really of all four of them, in tension. You, independence is a factor here. How are you going to make that decision, not just bow to the wishes of a powerful politician? Uh, seeking the truth and reporting as fully as possible. I do believe that there is truth to be reported in the tax return. Minimize harm is very important. Uh, assuming that the candidate is telling the truth, and I'm going to accept that he is in this case about his sister's situation, uh, you want to minimize harm. The, the key here, though, is the word minimize in harm. It's not do no harm. I've had many journalists come back to me over the years and say, thank you very much for telling me that it's okay to, and we should do no harm. The reality is in journalism, when we are probing on stories, when we report situations of tragedy in our society and on and on, we cause some level of intrusion, some level of emotional harm to the public by the very nature of reporting. The key is to minimize it by taking steps that show a level of respect, a level of empathy, a level of concern for vulnerable individuals. And then we choose alternatives that allow us to minimize while still telling the truth. In rare cases, the minimize harm is so strong that we hold back the truth. There's a hostage situation that's ongoing and there's uh, great risk to law enforcement officers and or hostages. We may hold back some of the truth and reporting until that situation is resolved to the level where the harm is greatly diminished. In some situations, we do hold back the names of individuals who are victims of sexual uh, assault and sexual abuse and on and on, because that's very important. But the guiding principles give us a way, along with the questions, to have a process to get to that question at the bottom of, of your, uh, your note there, Bonnie, what is the ethical answer? The ethical answer is one that's arrived at through very thoughtful, substantive, careful decision-making. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it, there are two other points I would make, one of which is if you go through our SPJ code, one of the things that will strike you is that there, there are very few absolutes um, in the code. Um, it's always avoid this, try to do that, but it, it, we rarely speak in absolutes when we talk about ethics. And I think the other point that can be made that is that we're, we're not often talking about right decisions or wrong decisions. Ethical decisions are sometimes different. There's some place in the middle where we just need to find the best spot and explain ourselves. 
That's right. And aspirational is a key word when it comes to ethics codes and standards and practices. We aspire to be the best we can be given difficult circumstances and often competing facts that we know and some that we don't know. You know, this discussion reminds me of a case where I think truth is listed first among the principles, it is. because it is the most important of them. Um, a case in which minimize harm actually created harm was the um, a rape on campus story in, by Rolling Stone, in which editors in an effort to protect the identity of Jackie as the uh, alleged red rape victim was identified, uh, did not do enough fact checking to determine whether the st whole story was true or not. And as it ended up being, I think, one of the biggest journalism scandals of in, in recent memory, because it, it was not as reported. And it damaged the cause, which was probably at the heart of running this story, which was we, we need to be more attentive to victims' rights. And instead of sending that message, it sent the message that, well, some of these women are just making this stuff up. Right. By the way, uh, just for the benefit of those who are watching, in, if not now, later and not seeing the chat, Bonnie does say that in that particular case, they decided not to proceed with that story. We have another question uh, about whether or not we need a new fairness doctrine. Um, this would be something mm. presumably aimed at broadcasters uh, to ensure that both sides are presented in news coverage. Um, you know, a, a fairness doctrine was something that existed for a long time in broadcast. And uh, I, you know, one of the things that I recall is that what it tended to do is it actually intended to suppress um, any discussion um, opinionated discussion of controversial issues. Erwin, uh, since you're the only one of the three of us who's still a practicing uh, journalist mm -hmm. and you're a broadcaster, we're going to ask you to take the first swat on that one. Do we well, need a new fairness doctrine? I, 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 I would say no, um, only because the fairness doctrine represented a governmental intrusion on broadcast news organizations that we would never allow in newspapers. Um, I think one of the, and I, you know, a lot of people I know will disagree with me on this, but I do think that one of the things that helps us remain credible is the fact that we insist on our First Amendment independence, and we make the judgment calls and hopefully make them well. That's what builds our credibility, not having a government rule that says if you put somebody on who says the humans created climate change, we have to put on somebody else for the same amount of time that says, no, they don't. Um, it seems to me that's not uh, productive for our audience um, and it's not helpful for us down the road as journalists. And, and the Fairness Doctrine, if I have memory serves, and this is almost 40 years ago, ultimately was uh, dispatched by the courts. So I don't really think that's, there's an option there, but. Yeah, I, I well said. I, I think the, the argument you make is, uh, is spot on and I knew you'd do that. And that's why uh, I thought it was appropriate for you to say it. Thank you. So gentlemen, our, our hour is about up. Are there any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to pass along? Fred, start with you. Um, no, well, let me just say that as I, Bob has mentioned and as I think has it's, it's been uh, sort of in the background of our entire conversation, the uh, important way to arrive at an ethical decision is to consider the questions you need to ask as carefully as you consider the answers you finally come up with. It's, it's really all in asking the right questions. Yeah, well put. Uh, I would add one thought, which is different than what we've talked about so far, but I think it's important. Uh, anybody who's watching this would recognize that uh, the three of us are uh, from another era, mm -hmm. uh, at least started another era, practiced in another era. Uh, two of us are uh, gray in the beard, 
one of us has beautiful, nice gray hair and it's not Erwin or myself. <laughs> and uh, so it's very important to take what we're offering with at least a couple of grains of salt. Uh, I think that we offer meaningful, thoughtful, small W wise input and uh, based on our experiences. That said, my hope is that many young journalists and young journalism educators and scholars take a strong interest in journalism and media ethics and including very importantly, uh, individuals of color uh, who bring a different life experience than we do. Uh, some will be raised by a scientist as Fred was. There might be some who were raised by wolves as I was, uh, but uh, you know, individuals bring their own life experience. And as the three of us talked about the new element of the NPR standards and practices, uh, we aren't those journalists in that era. Uh, I think we bring a reasonable, hopefully thoughtful, meaningful perspective on it. But I think it's very important that these conversations increasingly include uh, individuals from a different era than we represent and who are much more diverse than the three of us are. I would second that. Yes, well said. All right. Fred Brown, Bob Steele, thank you both very much for joining us. A, a reminder uh, that this, if you have watched this, um, it will also be available eventually on YouTube. Um, so that if you have others who you think would benefit from viewing this, um, please uh, direct them that way. Um, I'm Erwin Gratz on behalf of the Society of Professional Journalists New England chapter. Thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon.